Greetings once again, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. We want to thank the Lord for committing 2021 as we continue receiving God's blessings and encouragement and comfort and uh, support and rebukes and correction through all the messages, the music, the lessons uh, that are coming to us, uh, whether for our little ones, our young people, and every one of us indeed, we want to thank the Lord for his mercies for his goodness that we are still being counted among the living when we are going through such a difficult time as this. But um, it is good because the Bible gives us assurance that there is still hope. Even for somebody who has died, there is still hope. I mean, how good can things be? That is why it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Even for our loved ones who are already departed from us through death, there is still hope. All is not lost because... Uh, Jesus says, whoever believes in me, I'll raise them on the last day. That is in John chapter 11. So there's always hope. For a Christian, there's always hope. There's nothing that a, I mean, the devil can do to a Christian. There's nothing. There's nothing. Because whatever the situation, there's still hope. And so as we continue, I'm going to share with us on a subject that I've titled, More About Jesus. More About Jesus. May we close our eyes in prayer. Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence, Lord, to be with us as we share and learn from your word so that um, we glorify your name, we praise you, and we honor you now and forevermore. Amen. We are reading here uh, from the book of uh, John, John chapter 12, verse 20 to 22. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival, that is in Jerusalem. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. So, um, we are learning here of a noble request that was made by some, some people, this, and these people were Greeks. So it could be, yeah, you know, so since they were Greeks, they were foreigners, really, in Jerusalem, and uh, they'd come all the way, maybe they were proselytes, converts, converts to Judaism, who had come in for a Jewish festival to Jerusalem. So they came, and while they were there, they heard or learned about uh, Jesus and all the wonderful things he was doing and what he was teaching. And they thought this was somebody special. They needed to meet him. They needed to have an encounter with this character. And so they came uh, to one of Jesus' disciples, uh, that is uh, to Philip. And they said, sir, we'd like to see Jesus. And then Philip took that uh, request to Andrew and uh, together, Andrew and Philip went and they told Jesus that uh, there are some guests here, some people who are here to see you. And let me say, brothers and sisters, our title, More About Jesus. I don't believe or think that this is the only time that people ever came with such a desire, with such a yearning, with such a quest, with such a longing, with such an expectation to see Jesus. They were in Jerusalem. They were there to worship, but they didn't want to just worship and just be, you know, uh, you know, rubbing shoulders with everybody else, mixing and mingling and, you know, just talking and seeing friends they hadn't seen in a long time. Ah, is that you? Is that you? Really? What, what, and so on. I mean, they, you know how it is like sometimes when it's camp meeting time. That, that's when people are catching up and so, oh, so what has happened so far? Oh, I started this company. So, oh, is this the car you're driving now? Oh, wow. And so is this your, yeah, oh, yes, my daughter-in-law. Uh, the one, I, I think I sent you a, 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 an invitation to a wedding. She's the one uh, wedding to my second son. You know, how we, we have so much to catch up on. And sometimes, you know, uh, some people perhaps can get distracted and lose the point. But, but these people here were not uh, like that. They wanted to have an encounter with Jesus. What a blessing it is. When we come to camp meeting, we're not just saying, oh, who are the preachers? 
who are, who are they seeing us? Which groups have been chosen to sing during care meeting this year? And who are the teachers? Who are taking the young people? Or how about the children? And sometimes, you know, uh, we can get bogged down with the details of such issues. Uh, what a blessing it is when we come to care meeting and we come with this desire, this yearning, this longing to see Jesus, to, to have an experience with Jesus in care meeting 2021. I pray that that is our desire, every one of us, because it is in encountering Jesus, in meeting with Jesus, in spending time with Jesus, that we are saved, we are transformed, we are reformed, we are uh, revived in spending time with Jesus. That's why these people came with a noble request. And I believe, brothers and sisters, every time we come to worship, Every time there's a call to worship, every time there's a sacred assembly, whether physically or virtually, every time there is a, you know, a call to convocation, a call to meet at the foot of the cross, uh, we need to come with such a desire, with such a yearning. And uh, we're living through uh, difficult times because of the pandemic that's raging. And uh, because of that, you know, and other situations in life, it is important for us to remember, to always point people to Jesus. People need the Lord. We need more of Jesus than anybody or anything else because only Jesus is the answer. It is Jesus and he's the one who's to save us from our sins, which are the primary uh, cause of our predicament as humanity. And so they came and they would see Jesus they wanted to see Jesus. Let me say, uh, this is people's desire. When people come to church, when people are listening to a message out of the Bible, they are looking for Jesus in whatever is shared, whatever is taught, because Jesus is the answer. And in times like these that we're going through that are so difficult, it's easy to really get lost, tracking all other, other kind of, kinds of things and scenarios and, you know, creating uh, and postulating about different kinds of scenarios and so on. Um, you know, and there are people who have said uh, different kind of, kinds of things. Let's, let's look, for example, um, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, there are two kinds of people. Let's say in the book of Revelation, there are two kinds of people. There are those, those who follow uh, Revelation 14, verse number 4. What does it say? Uh, 14 verse number four of the book of um, Revelation. So it says here, um, these are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They followed the lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the lamb. So this is talking about the 144,000, those who are redeemed, those who are saved. And one of the qualities is that they follow the lamb, they follow Jesus. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. They, they are with him wherever he goes. And so they are, in the book of Revelation, there are those who follow the lamb wherever he goes. But we also have another group, Revelation 13, verse number 13. Okay, rather, I think I need verse 3. On one of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder. And he followed the beast. <laughs> okay, so there are two leaders here. There is Jesus, and he has his followers. Then there's a beast, and it also has followers. Okay, it also has followers. So now, the burden of my message is that we need more of Jesus. Let's, let's be clear about this. The beast is there. He is a reality. He's a real entity. As the Bible says, it's clear and it's true. But don't follow the beast. Follow the lamb. Follow Jesus. Uh, you are a follower of Jesus. The followers of Jesus follow the lamb wherever he goes. There are some wild followers of Jesus follow the beast wherever he goes. <laughs> they follow the beast wherever he goes while being followers of Jesus. Uh, John chapter 10, verse number 16. Jesus says, 
I have sheep that are not yet part of this fold, but they too will come. They will hear my voice. They will hear my voice. In chapter, same chapter, verse number 27, he says, My sheep know my voice. They don't follow strangers. They follow the lamb. They follow the good shepherd. That's why Jesus also says, I'm the good shepherd. And you know, back then in Palestine, the way they used to, um, you know, to look after their sheep is that shepherds would actually, instead of driving, they would lead the sheep. They would walk in front and the sheep would come. And sometimes the shepherds would come together, just like the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, those were in, you know, Bethlehem, uh, outside Bethlehem when Jesus was born. So sometimes uh, shepherds would come together like that and their sheep, their flocks would get mingled up, you know, mixed up. But, and so when the shepherds wanted to go home, the way they would do it, they would stand at different places and each shepherd had a distinct sound that they would make, whether it was a whistle, whether it was a shout, whether it was a laugh, laughter, whether it is whatever kind of sound. But the sheep could easily recognize each one, the voice of their master. And that's how they separated uh, from, the, you know, uh, from being mixed up. And each one of them would follow where the voice of the shepherd is coming from. And that's how they got separated. And the shepherd would then walk in front and the sheep following behind. That's why there are those who are following the beast and there are those who are following the lamb. Jesus says, my sheep know my sound. They know my voice. They know when they hear that, that's what they follow. And so, you know, each uh, flock has to learn the voice of its shepherd. It's not necessary for, for the sheep to have to learn the, all the other wrong voices. Uh, what they need is to learn the right voice. And once they know that right voice, that's all they need to follow. And you don't have to worry about following the wrong shepherd. Because you just have to learn the, the voice of the, the true voice, the authentic voice of the shepherd. And once you know that one and you follow that one, there is no way by mistake you're going to be found ending up following the beast. You know, sometimes it's, it, can be, it can be a strong temptation to want to get into details about this is what uh, the beast is doing. And uh, the Pope coughed last night. He coughed three times. And there's a verse to support those coughs. He sneezed once. And this is what the sneeze means. And, you know, and we spend our time talking about this one. Did you see how they shook hands? That handshake. There's something in that handshake. And did you, I mean, we're spending time learning the voice of the beasts instead of learning and mastering the voice of the shepherd. That is a strong temptation. Don't follow the beast wherever he goes. The title of the message is follow the lamb. More about Jesus. Follow the lamb wherever he goes. Follow the lamb. You don't have to worry whether uh, the beast has a headache or hiccups, whatever it is. We, we need to understand this. The messages that we find in the book of Revelation, for example, the book of Daniel, uh, these, these are special type of literature in the Bible called apocalyptic literature. Very special kind of literature, which we need to understand clearly. Although most times we just say prophecy. Well, yeah, in a sense, that's right, but that's imprecise. And it can lead to misunderstandings, misunderstandings and misinterpretations. Because when you come to the start of the Bible, when we talk prophecy, we are talking books like Amos, Jeremiah, Isaiah. That is what is known as classical prophecy. But the moment we go into books like Revelation and Daniel, there are a special kind of literature, which is called apocalyptic literature. And it has unique characteristics, which uh, we need to take time to actually study and to learn. Like its origins, its progress, everything like that. And uh, it's a whole, whole uh, subject. But I'm saying this is a fertile ground for the devil to preoccupy us by learning his tricks and whatever he's doing. I mean, I don't care what the devil, whether he's a headache or he's hungry. I mean, that's none of my business. I believe it should be none of anybody else's business also. As Christians, let's follow the lamb wherever he goes. There is no way one would just wake up to find themselves that uh, 
uh, although they were following Jesus, they have ended up with the beast. What we need is more about Jesus. When these people, these Greeks came, they said, we, we want to see Jesus. I'm glad they didn't come to Jerusalem to see the beast. They wanted to see Jesus. There were authorities in Jerusalem who could be the equivalent of the beast power, the ones who destroyed Jesus in Jerusalem. They were representing that kind of entity or they were working under the same kind of scheme and paradigm. But their interest was in seeing Jesus. Even today, what should preoccupy us when we read, when we pray, when we teach, when we preach? It is Jesus. It is Jesus. All these other things. The other time, we went to town talking about the Ottoman Empire and everything like that. And who is talking about the Ottoman Empire today? Who is talking about that? The other time, it was the ATMs. That this is the mark of the beast. The ATMs, the, the cards. And the other time, it was the, um, you know, those, the, 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 the codes on products that we buy in Subam, the barcodes. We went to town about that. And these things are taught in our churches. Although not taught by the church, but us as believers. And then, the other time, say, okay, now it's no longer that. Now it's this one. You know, what those things do is, they bring sensationalism. What, what that means is, if someone begins to preach like that, or to teach like that, and they make that their area of specialization, you attract a lot of attention for some time, <laughs> okay? For some time. A lot of following, a lot of interest for some time. People will say, out of Hitler, he's the Antichrist, he's what, what, and so on. And people will follow that for some time. And then Hitler commits suicide in the bunker in, in Berlin. He's gone. And then the people say, ah, no, no, now we found a new one. Now it's Benito Mussolini. Ah, no, now we found a new one. Now it's, what it then does is, it brings disillusionment over time. Eventually, people get disillusioned. Not only that, people then eventually become cynical and they become critical and they come to a point where they reject the Bible and its message. It then destroys their faith and their confidence in the word of God. So we need to be careful what we promote, what we teach, what we utter, especially on church platforms. One thing that you can never go wrong with, lift up Christ. Let him be known. Let him be the one. Because when people come to church, they want to see Jesus. They are not in church to see the beast. People are in church to see Jesus. That's why these people came and they said, Sir, we would want to see Jesus. That is the request and the desire and the expectation and the yearning of every person tuning into this channel. That is the desire. When people hear that uh, the Bible is being read, being preached, being taught in this or that place, they want to see Jesus. Not more of the beast. Is the beast real? Yes. But should it be our preoccupation? Never. It is Jesus. Follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Let's follow the Lamb. So, why is this information given then, Pastor? If you're saying it should not be our preoccupation and so on. Aha, uh -huh, very good question. This information in uh, like apocalyptic texts like uh, Revelation, Daniel, is given, number one, not to terrify the saints. You know, there are some seminars you attend some sermons you listen to, some uh, preaching that is done, which leaves people quaking in their pews, shaking and quaking, <laughs> you know, and suspicious of everything and everybody. And people live in that kind of state of mind with under siege mentality. They do not rejoice in salvation. They are terrified and so on and so on. Um, you know, the reason why those, those messages were given is because the church is still uh, the church militant. They are hostile forces the devil is using to fight against the church. And so Jesus says, I even know what he is planning to do. Let me tell you, he will do this and this and this and that. But at the end, I'll be victorious. 
At the end, you'll be triumphant. For example, to the church in Smyrna, it says, I know, you will put some of you in prison, and some of you will even lose your lives, but be faithful unto death. He's just preparing them ahead of time. He's not saying, okay, go and look which prisoner, uh, which uh, prison officer is going to be in charge of the prison cell that you're going to be into. And, and then they spend all their time, which jail am I going to be sent to? That was not the business of the believers in Smyrna. Jesus is simply assuring them that don't be shocked when these things happen. I know that uh, they're going to come and you should know that they're going to come. But the message is given as an assurance that God is with you all the way. No matter what the devil may think to do, what he will do, who he will use, or whatever. No matter what, God will be triumphant and all his saints will be victorious. So the message is given not to satisfy idle curiosity about how events are going to turn out and so on and so on in detail. We know in like a, a, a sketch, we have a sketch. But the challenge comes when every day we are trying to fill in the detail and say this one flew to this country and so they, we heard that they met. We don't know what they discussed, but we know that uh, this is what they... Yeah, and, you know, all those kind of things, those kind of things, those kind of nitty-gritty, we want to see Jesus more and to follow him. Once you follow Jesus, you don't have to worry about many other things. You know, I, I'm told that people work in the banks as bank tailors and others. All they are taught are the features of the genuine knot, you know, like money. The genuine knot, they don't have to study the fake ones. They have to know the genuine one. And whatever kind of shape or form or color, the fake money will come in. They can tell. Because it's not genuine. All they study is the genuine one. Then they don't worry about whatever people are creating to make fake money. They don't worry about that. If it's not genuine, they will tell. So what we need is to learn more the voice of the shepherd and to lift up Jesus more. Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. We don't have to lift the beast. <laughs> Let's lift up Jesus. Let's lift up Jesus. And when he's lifted up, he will draw all people to himself. Um, so in other words, these messages were given not to terrify the saints, but to glorify God. They were given to inspire hope, not to paralyze the saints with fear, but to inspire hope that no matter what the devil is going to do, you will be triumphant. But God did not say, give us a commission to go and study the devil's methods. No, that's none of our business. Our business is to follow the Lamb, to see Jesus, to lift up Jesus. People are saying, we want to see Jesus. And um, I, I like what um, Dr. Michael J. Uh, Girl said. He said, Dear Theology 101, no passage of scripture directs Christians to prepare for, uh, for the Antichrist, but numerous passages instruct them to await Christ's return. It's a real problem if your end times expectations are, uh, are anti-Christ-centered fear, in brackets, rather than Christ-centered hope, in brackets. Uh, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. So he says, there is no passage of scripture that says it should be my burden, your burden, to study what the devil is planning to do next and who is going to, whatever and so on. But there are many passages that tell us to prepare for Jesus' coming. But some people prepare more for the Antichrist's coming than for Christ's coming. <laughs> you know? And this writer is saying there's a problem there. Once it gets to that point, there's a problem. In other words, and he says, focusing on the Antichrist and his activities and his plans and whatever, it stokes fear rather than faith and hope. It brings fear in many people. But if we focus on Christ, it brings hope that no matter what will happen, we will be successful in the end. We will be triumphant. And God's desire is that we focus on lifting up Christ. Let's follow the Lamb. Let's learn his voice. Let's distinguish it from all other voices. Let's follow that voice, the voice of the Lamb. 
It's easy. And some people may say, well, this is actually, you need to be talking about <laughs> and so on and so on. Uh, because this is what's really happening. That's what we said the other time when the Ottoman Empire was here. That's what we say. And so what do you say now? Don't make it your business to follow the beast. Follow the lamb. Don't worry. The, you cannot even deal with the beast. Only Jesus can. Follow the lamb, the one who can deal with the beast. Can you deal with the beast yourself? Can you? People think that we are going to be saved by knowledge and information. Information of what the beast is planning to do, then okay, we are going to maneuver this way. If he's planning, then we are going to maneuver this way. That's not how we are saved. We are saved by Jesus. Only he can face up to the beast and destroy him in the end. So, I like what the request brought by these Greeks. They came and they said, say, we want to see Jesus. Are people seeing Jesus in what we are preaching, what I'm teaching, what um, are people seeing Jesus? Or they see more of the beast than Jesus. How many times is Jesus mentioned in some of these presentations? Don't we hear more of the beast than of Jesus? Someone said, it is a law of life that by beholding, you become changed. If you are beholding the beast more than Christ, you may actually be changing into the image of that beast, into his likeness, into his character, without you realizing. You may actually be being transformed. Let's focus more on Jesus and be transformed into his image and likeness. How about that? We want to see Jesus. It can be quite tricky. That information is not given to tell us about, to give us a timetable and, uh, so that you tick all the boxes and say, oh, now this has happened. Oh, Obama has done this. Ah, so it means this. Ah, and this one. Ah, so it means this. And so on and so on. Ah, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. be, 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 be very careful. Be very careful. It can really be slippery slope. Let's, but you'll never go wrong by following the lamb Pointing people to the Lamb. Only he has a victory over the beast and his allies. I don't have to understand the devil in order to be saved. I need to accept Jesus in order to be saved. That's all I need. That's why these people came and said, Sir, we want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. So we need to be very clear and to be very careful so that we are not carried away and then end up saying and doing things which, if Christ doesn't come, 60 years from now, people will look back and say, oh, really? This is what these guys believed? Oh, man. So why should I believe what they're saying now? If they said this about that product then, and it didn't turn out to be that, and now they have shifted to this, so it brings disillusionment and scorn. People laugh and they walk out of church. They say it's a circus. It's a joke. It has happened before. That's why we're saying it like that. It has happened before. I've attended dissertation presentations where people have given the statements and positions that have been held and promoted and taught authoritatively, which have come to nothing today. So, let's follow the lamb. More about Jesus, I would know. More of his love, as of his you know, of his, more of his saving grace. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want. The assurance of his soon coming. And that he will take us out, out of all these problems. Don't you want to see Jesus? Don't you want more of Jesus? Don't you want an encounter with Jesus? I don't wish to meet the beast. I don't even care about uh, that. What I am interested in is to see Jesus more and to point others to Christ in whatever little way I can. And God is calling you to Jesus, and also for you to point people to Christ. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. Is it your desire to say, Lord, I just want to thank you, and I want that hope that we have in you, that no matter what the devil is going to try and do, the Gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The devil is going to come up with all kinds of sinister plots and plans and schemes and clandestine methods and, uh, you know, 
all these kind of things. But in the end, Jesus will be victorious. And he wants you to be a share in that victory. He wants you to be a share in that victory. You know, during the war, there used to be these messages broadcast from Maputo and, Lus and, uh, and, Mapu and Lusaka in Zambia. Messages that were broadcast into Zimbabwe. Sometimes some of the experiences were so painful, so harsh, you know, the harsh realities of war. But people would get encouraged when they would hear the leaders addressing from out of the country and saying, people of Zimbabwe, victory is certain. Victory is certain. In other words, the leaders were not, did not spend their time telling the masses of Zimbabwe what the Rhodesian forces were planning to do and how they were planning to torture the villagers. If they would spend more time, then they're doing the, they, they're actually servicing the other side. If they are busy telling, you know, and so on and so on. Uh, we need to hear more about Jesus. Of course, they made it clear this is war. Some will die and everything. But victory is certain. When you read the book of Revelation, when you read the book of Daniel, you are, it's like listening to a broadcast from heaven and it's telling you that victory is certain. Don't major in studying, uh, you know, the other side. Let us know. Let's know he's real. He's not a joke. But our victory, our hope, our security is only in Jesus. And so we need to spend more time with Jesus. Let's follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Let's follow the Lamb all the way to glory. May God bless you and may God help us to know that we have a Savior who cares and is coming again for you and I. Uh, may God bless you. May God help me uh, as well. Let us close our eyes together as we pray. Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, may your name be praised. May your name be glorified. Indeed, people want to see Jesus. They want an experience and an encounter with you, Lord. And how I pray that as we teach, as we preach, as we sing, as we do all that we do in your name, may people see more of you than anybody or anything else. May Jesus be lifted up. May your name be praised. May your name be glorified. We pray with this hope and assurance that you will never leave nor forsake us until the day you will come to take us home. In your name we pray, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>